Doing justice to a great club in 10 minutes or so is a tall order. Back in my younger days, I would have rambled for half an hour or more on any single topic. Tonight, I hope to encapsulate the spirit, lifeblood and ethos of 35 years of our great cricket club in virtually the blink of an eye. To keep me to time, this tribute is recorded and to hold your interest, I have scoured the archives for photos that will bring back many memories. 35 years ago, a group of mates who mainly hailed from the New Street Methodist Cricket Club in the Brighton area joined forces to form the Kamura Cricket Club. With only a bare number of players, the club entered the DDCA B-grade Melthoid competition. In the first season, the club played its home games at the Heatherhill High School while an oval was being developed in Kamura Road, hence the club's name. Folklore over the years tells us that the name is Aboriginal for Wallabies Drinking, referring to the wildlife in the bushland south of the Oval. Under the drive and vision of Club Secretary Darrell Fisher, supported by President Roger Pearce and the early members, the club quickly grew and started junior development. The club's first game was in October 1975 against Kalora Park, the team was Darrell Fisher captain, Mark Fisher, Neil Dixon, Doug Fitcher, Phil Morris, Graham Kent, Roger Pearce, Joe Azodi, Des Hurst, R. Walker and George Grek. The club beat Dandenong Blues to win the Premiership in its first year. Kamura was all out for 459, Roger Pearce top scored with 131 and Dandy Blues were all out for 322. In the club's second year, matches were played at Kamura Reserve, initially on Melthoid. After two years as president, Roger Pearce handed over to Rod Mona, or was it Grona Lovett. The fledgling club was establishing itself at Kamura, securing a turf wicket, recruiting seniors and juniors, and developing the club. Under first coach Mark Fisher, Kamura won four senior flags and one junior flag in its first five years. Achieving a turf wicket in 1979 was a major milestone, but early times were tough as the committee men were also key players and finances were tight. To assist the club through difficult times, Steve Cogger's dad, Ray, stepped up as the third president. 1980-81, saw Tom Carroll also take over as club coach and Ian Davidson became treasurer. Many of you will remember Ray Cogger chairing a crisis meeting and having many members pledging money in secret to secure the club. Many of the original members are still active around the club. I had been a workmate of David Zack and Doug Fitcher at ACI Fiberglass and I was introduced to Kamura because it was a good place for a beer on the way home from work. And so it was that in 1982-83, I became the fourth president. Kamura Cricket Club became a local institution, not only for its players, but also for their families and friends. The club was the centre of social life for all of us. Many good cricketers came to play at Kamura, and many have been strong members of the club ever since. And Kamura regularly fielded five senior teams, so a large number of players have represented us at all levels. Having started with a bang in the late 70s, senior flags eluded us, except for an F-grade win in 1983-84. However, during the 80s we did win five junior flags under the expert guidance of John O'Donnell. John was ably supported by a band of senior players who were great junior coaches. Those who come to mind were Ian Pretty, David Zack, John Williams, Bernie May, Barry Wenke, Bill Fowler and Jock Carroll. Along with John O'Donnell, these guys had a real passion to work with junior cricketers and develop both their skills and their sportsmanship. The proof of their coaching success is the number of Kamura juniors, many coached by their fathers, who went on to become successful senior cricketers. Some too graduated to Premier District cricket ranks. In 1991-92, the club broke an eight-year drought of senior flags, winning premierships in three senior grades, Turf 3, C grade and G grade. 
These wins were very memorable and the club was in good shape on and off the field. Dwayne Neal, Ron Cummings and Lee Norrish were very proud captains. The firsts were widely applauded. Ron Cummings' team also became instant all-stars and of course Lee Norrish's fifths were the toast of the club. As club coach for only the one year, Rick Collings' record of three senior premierships is amazing. But it is not just the cricketing success of Kamura which has made ours a great club. During this period, many notable characters contributed to the story that makes the Kamura Cricket Club such a vibrant and fun place. Please forgive me as I can only mention a few. John Harris, who ably led his young team on and off the field, introduced many players to the delights of Melbourne's other nightlife. Rob Hornidge, who taught many of us that guys with rough edges can be true fans and who became master of the indoor spit roast. Bernie May, who has done all the hard work and dirty jobs for as long as anyone can remember. Kerry Reid, our long-term curator, and his faithful dog Baron were long-time supporters of Kamura and lived at the club, literally. Jeff Neal ran the bar from his garage of a Friday night in those years when the soccer club was not helpful, following in Dunny's footsteps. Bill Arthur, the one-time Port Melbourne footballer, was also a lucky man. He won the two-man canoe which hung in the rooms for many years. Cost him a fortune to truck it away. Young Squizzy won the loaded giant esky. The items had been made in fibreglass by Kerry Reed's mates. Jock Carroll, whose handiwork saw the high bar tables and the honour board made, and remember the wooden track for the Cup Eve guinea pig races. Kevin Spook Vines, who always stayed late to get the bar takings to Davo, but who struggled with swimming on a memorable trip away. George, buy a book from me this Sunday and receive a free billiards table. Grek has continued as a supporter from being a player on day one. Mark Rock Fisher has always had a good marketing edge for sale normally with one of his label house labels attached. For those game, I have a couple of bottles of Kamura port here tonight to sample out of Kamura glasses. Porky Phillips, whose name became synonymous with our colourful bar and who with Steve Cogger organised beer at the right price from Victoria Barracks, could usually advise where the local booze buses were and introduced many of our juniors to police in uniform. Brian Dunn, the master bar manager who reintroduced barrelled beer and clipped tickets, improved our bar takings and became an institution both at Kamura and now here at the Noble Park RSL. For many years, Friday Sippers sessions were held in Brian's well-appointed shed. Colin Smales, who as a paid player tested the DDCA's then Rule 59 to the limit, as he accepted payment in wine paid for on My American Express card. Justin Woodman, initially a young rebel who is now a very successful committee man and club administrator. Lee Williams, who with Travis Kent stepped up as regular function organisers, MCs and committee men, being early members of the next generation to step up to these roles. After 10 years, I passed the presidency to my great mate Steve Cogger who became the fifth president and the only one to achieve the elusive Turf One flag. Steve was a very hands-on president who was determined to achieve success on the field, and he was true to his word. He also believed in the importance of ongoing family connections and traditions around the club. In February 1995, a memorable dinner dance was held at Pastels to celebrate the club's 20th anniversary. This brought together three generations of club members in quite a few families. A year later in 1995-96, after 21 years, the club won its first Turf One flag. The fantastic achievement was particularly sweet, with club founder Darrell Fisher being chairman of selectors in the memorable year. The team was captained by Rick Colling and coached by Gordon King. The celebrations were long, loud and well deserved. Kevin Patterson took over the reins as president number six from Steve for two years in 96, 97 and 97, 98 and continued to ensure the club was competitive on the field and socially. But after a turf one flag, it is always hard to maintain the momentum. 
For personal reasons, Kevin relinquished the presidency back to Steve in 1988-1999. And with Steve at the helm, the club repeated the performance, winning its second Turf One flag in Rob Harrod's first year as coach, this time beating North Dandenong, where Steve and Harvey Smith had both been players in their younger days. The victory was very sweet. Steve resigned and young Travis Kent stepped in as our seventh president. Travis did a fantastic job with heaps of support and successfully hosted our 25th anniversary dinner in January 2001 in a seated marquee on the Kamura Oval. Lee Williams was MC. A 25th anniversary team of champions was announced to much discussion, only to be expected with Joe and Zaki as selectors. And Peter Blaskett and Jerry G gave a memorable, if somewhat risque, performance. Hilary Widgeratney hankered for the role and in season 2002-03 became our eighth president. Hilary and his wife Angela steered the club through some tight financial times and are also remembered for the focus on further developing our juniors. Not since John O'Donnell's time many years earlier had we seen such a focus on the juniors. In 2002-03 and 2005-06, Kamura won the DDCA one-day competition flags, coincidentally beating Buckley Ridges on both occasions. These wins were another clear indication of the ability of the Kamura Club to reinvigorate itself and grow with the new trends, even in tough times. In January 2006, a 30th anniversary dinner was held at Azura's and Steve Johnson ably led the organising. The dinner featured the rock band Rock Around the World. In 2006-2007, Kimura won the Turf 2 flag, ending another eight drought years. Many of you here tonight will know the more recent history of the club much better than I do. Steve Johnson took over as the ninth president in 2009-2010 with Hillary completing seven years. Like Kevin Patton, Patterson, Steve had a strong record in football administration with exceptional skills in maintaining sponsorships, fundraising and nurturing growth and has successfully revived the strong club and family and social tradition. Many are assisting Steve and the club remains in good hands both old and new. In my mind, guys like Daryl, Graham, Troy, Dougie, Simon and Adam, and there are many others, have got the hop back into the ruse. While Kimura has only had nine presidents, we have had 21 coaches in 35 years. Mark Fisher, Tom Carroll and Rob Harrod each coached for four years and Craig Ortland for three. Only eight of the 21 coaches snared a senior flag. Of the others, many were great blokes out of luck. Gary Todd, John Crofts, Rob Young. Others were legends on a mission like Neil Jones or Keith Jans. In my view, the coaching honours go to Rick Colling for his Turf 3, C and G grade wins in 91-92 and to Gordon King and Rob Harrod for their respective Turf 1 wins. On the field, we have had literally hundreds of great players and many of the best have been homegrown. Over 35 years of the club championship, Tom Carroll has won it five times and Matt Wenke three times. All our champions have been great club men. Speaking of which, 38 people have been awarded the best clubman over 35 years and only Barry Wenke has the distinction of winning the award twice. Five women have received the award. Sharon Berger, Marie Brown, Moira Neal, Angela Widgeratney and Margaret Nutting. Multiple winners have been awarded three times. The club has been truly blessed with some great workers. And all too often the contributions of wives, partners and girlfriends has gone unsung. Over all 35 years, women members have made a great contribution to this club. Jerry Fisher was the first treasurer. Jan Cogger and Angela Widgeratney were both secretaries. But numerous women worked tirelessly to ensure the club functioned smoothly and everyone enjoyed themselves. Mums, grandmothers and girlfriends, we thank you all. Many club members have made a significant contribution to sports administration in the DDCA and elsewhere. 
Most notably, Graham Kent has been an organisational and fundraising stalwart for Kamura for each of its 35 years. Tom Carroll was president of the DDCA and later became president of the Druin Golf Club. I was proud to follow Tom as president of the DDCA, as well as going on to have 11 years as president of Dandenong Cricket Club. Joe Azodi went from Secretary of Kamura to be the Secretary of the DDCA. Mark Fisher, Alan Craig and lately Hilary Widgeratney were all valued members on the DDCA executive over a number of years. Craig Ortland became the long-term president of Noble Park Cricket Club. Doug Fitcher is now the Secretary of the Rye Bowls Club. Keith Jans went on to higher coaching duties with Frankston and now with Camberwell Magpies. Stan Nell, after many years coaching locally, has furthered his coaching career in Sri Lanka. And a number of players like Chris Dillon and Matt Wanky went on to play higher cricket. But perhaps it is the family and social connections that have proved to be the enduring legacy of the Kamura community. Kids who were babes in arms in the early days of Kamura and came to the club to watch their dads play have grown up to become senior players or committee men and outstanding guys in the community. Stephen Zack and Travis Kent are just two great examples. And lifelong friendships were formed, not only while playing or watching cricket. Many special events became an integral part of the annual social calendar. Cup Eve is still an outstanding social tradition as well as a great fundraising source. Can you remember the racing guinea pigs or Wall Emerson in silks? Barrels by candlelight featured children of all ages joining in the Christmas spirit, a true family occasion. And like auctions and Christmas parties, these Kimura traditions continue. The annual Christmas party with Santa Claus arriving to a police siren or accompanied by the Pink Panther or genuine little green Christmas elves was the first time many youngsters visited Kamura, and these were truly great family days. Presentation dinners were a highlight of many years when trophies were dispensed and tall stories got taller and often shaggier. The year often culminated with a return to nature on the annual trip away. Many memorable times were had communing with nature at Maccas at Rye or at Harry's at New G. And I understand Ballarat was pretty successful last weekend. And as friends do, we have also celebrated and shared the triumphs and tragedies of life. The Kamura family has celebrated some great weddings, notably Darrell's, Fraser Nielsen's and Woody's. And we have come together to farewell close friends in tough circumstances. Kevin Vines, John O'Donnell, Ashley Craig, Rex Norden and Barry Nutting all come to mind. But life for Kamura has always gone on from strength to strength. Going forward, the ethos of this great club will continue to nurture and train young cricketers to achieve their ultimate potential in the sport. And the leadership will continue to focus on building sportsmanship and a strong sense of community in a caring and socially inclusive family environment. We are still indebted to those original cricketers who had the vision and the courage to start their own club and we thank them for the participation, pleasure, friendships and for the many the chance to see their sons grow to men on the cricket field. Those that can lend a hand around the club should do so. I trust that many of you will be around for the next exciting 30 years of this great club. Others of us will at least try to make it to Kamura's 50th anniversary in 15 years' time. Thank you all for being a vital part of the Kamura story. <laughs>